Welcome to part three of my video series on baking artisan bread. In this video we're going to actually look at the baking process. If you want to learn about uh, what bread is made of uh, or how to uh, start and maintain a chef or a, some natural yeast, you can look at part one. If you want to know how to actually uh, make artisan bread up to the point of having a proofed loaf ready for baking, you can look at part two. Alright, about 30 minutes before baking, we're going to set up the oven. We're going to preheat it to about 500 degrees. And you see here that I've placed a, a baking stone or half of a baking stone uh, and a cast iron pot in my oven. The baking stone I'm using is about three quarter inch, so it's not one of those thinner half inch ones uh, that you often will find like for pizza, uh, pizza stones. It's a heftier one. This is the cast iron pot that I bake in. Nothing special to it. So we're preheating the oven for, for 25 to 30 minutes. This is necessary to get the pot and the baking stone up to that temperature. And you want to place the dough in, in that environment with, those, um, with that environment hot initially. And then, of course, those will cool down as they're in contact with the dough. But they'll also be working to bake the dough at that point. This is the boule loaf after about 60 minutes of proofing at room temperature. Um, the visible part here that we see is actually going to be the underside of the loaf. So we're going to flip this over gently and down into the cast iron pot um, and bake it uh, that way. So, uh, of course, transferring it is, is a delicate process. You don't want to throw it down there because all the bubbles, the CO2 bubbles that are, have been developing inside this dough would, uh, would eat, tend to, at least some of them, escape and the dough will go flat. So you transfer it uh, carefully. This is the baguette loaf after about 60 minutes of proofing. Again, the visible part will be the underside of the loaf once rolled over onto the baking stone. Uh, another view of it. I'll typically dust the top with flour before transferring it. You can see it's glossy there and, and moist, uh, but I'll, I'll put some dust or cornmeal on it so that it does not stick to um, the surface when I roll it over. Uh, here you see the, the baguette that's in on the baking stone. I didn't have a picture of how I did that, but I essentially have a wooden peel. So that's like a thin breadboard that has a long handle to it. I put some cornmeal or flour onto the, the peel to dust it. Uh, and then you gently roll the dough, the proof dough uh, or loaf over onto the peel. And you want to do this gently so that you don't deflate the risen loaf. And if it's, uh, as long as you have flour cornmeal between the, board, the wood and the bottom of the loaf, you can then slide uh, with kind of a little jerk, quick action, you can slide the loaf onto the baking stone, sliding it off the peel. Uh, I slash the top of the loaf with, uh, with a razor. I'll show you here in a second. And then for the first 15 minutes or so, water can be misted into the oven with a hand mister to add moisture that can help to develop the crust of your uh, of your loaf. You do want to be really careful in electric ovens that you don't thermally shock the heating element down at the bottom. I have some um, experience with that in cracking those elements and nearly um, basically starting some welding that almost led to burning the house down. So uh, that's why eventually we went to a gas oven because I don't have that problem. Some cornmeal that you can use to dust the, the board if you wish. Here's the blade slid over a skewer used to slash the bread tops. Uh, I think I realize this this uh, blade is I think a blade that I've had for uh, close to as long as we've been married, about 25 years or so. It's stainless steel is never uh, obviously rusted and I only use it for this purpose so it sits in a jar and I pull it out every time I bake bread. Here's the uh, bread after some minutes in the oven Here's another view. Uh, this is after about 15 minutes. Usually after about 15 minutes, I turn the oven down to about 380 degrees. Here's the boule and the cast iron pot uh, after the same amount of time, 15 minutes. We'll reduce the heat to 380 and then bake for another 25 to 35 minutes. <coughs> the baguette is about ready to come out. It doesn't have to bake as long as the, the boule just because of the um, it it's, uh, doesn't have as big of a girth, so heat can travel into it more quickly, and it's in contact uh, yeah, with the baking stone, so it'll bake a little quicker. 
here it is on the cooling rack and you can see the the flower pattern that's due to the the uh, the proofing on in the couche uh, here is uh, the bull uh, with the lid removed for the last 10 minutes it's not necessary but a lot of times I'll take the lid off for for a final 10 minutes of baking it can help to brown the top and uh, this is after the 15 minutes at 495 20 minutes at 380 and then another 10 minutes at 380 with the lid removed it's cooling on the rack there's a close-up you see the pretty pattern of flower uh, notice the difference in color due to the baking in the Dutch oven. So I think this is due to the uh, the really intense and even radiant heat that is coming from the walls of the Dutch oven in combination with the high moisture environment, the, the moisture that is coming off of the loaf, uh, right? The dough is, there's water in the dough that is evaporating and it fills that void uh, inside the Dutch oven between the walls and the bread and basically provides the high moisture that leads to a crunchy crust. So the, the appearance and the, the, the taste, the experience is, is a lot is superior when you bake in the Dutch oven. Uh, note also how the baguette on the left blew open at the seams. This is due to having experimented with using the low gluten soft white flour. Uh, the boule on the right is a bit more forgiving. It's the same exact dough. So if I had used hard red winter wheat uh, for the recipe, I wouldn't have had that uh, blowing open at the seam that I that, that we see here in the baguette Here's the mill that I used to grind whole wheat flour. You can buy whole wheat flour at the store But uh, whole wheat flour has a very limited shelf life after about 72 hours the um, the germ portion of the of the grain uh, Will oxidize or at least begins oxidizing and it starts getting rancid So it tastes bitter and this is what leads people to thinking that if you bake with uh, whole wheat flour you know, things don't taste good. They taste, you know, quote unquote healthy but bitter. Um, it's really because whole wheat flour at the store is just not shre is not fresh. But if you grind it fresh, when it when the when the wheat berry, which you see here, this is hard red winter wheat, it has a long shelf life, 10 years or more, because it's sealed. Uh, the bran on the outside seals the the um, germ and the endosperm on the inside. The endosperm is the white part of the flour that we get from refined white flour. The germ uh, has uh, protein and I think it has some oils, um, but at any rate it will, uh, it, it, that's what oxidizes and goes rancid. So it makes all the difference to have freshly ground wheat. Uh, you can make, we make uh, cookies and pancakes. A lot of times we'll make it almost 100% whole wheat. People wouldn't know that in fact they say hey, it's great, it's great, these are great cookies and then you come to find out that it's made from 100% whole wheat and they're surprised. Um, so we started, um, initially we got a mill that was a hand mill, you just turn a crank and mill it and once we realized okay we're going to do this uh, regularly and use uh, this as our source of flour, uh, then we bought the electric mill which we've had for probably 25 years, it's a good mill. Uh, we don't use only wheat flour, whole wheat flour, we use white flour also, so a lot of times I use a combination of the two. This particular recipe was 100% uh, uh, whole wheat. This is another batch of dough, this time using about 60% hard red wheat and 40% soft white wheat. Still in, in this example I'm using no uh, white flour, which it actually usually I, is uncommon, I usually do add some white flour. Uh, note the loaf on the left was baked in the Dutch oven, loaf on the right on the baking stone you can visibly see the difference there. But even so on the right you see the seams did not blow open like the baguette did and I think that's due to the higher gluten content um, due to the 60% hard red wheat in this uh, dough. Another view, uh, typically the percentage of whole wheat that I use in a bread recipe might only be 40 to 50%, sometimes even a bit less, so it makes a lighter bread and a crumb. Um, but for these experiments, I, I used 100% whole wheat. Incidentally, um, there are people who have uh, an allergy not to uh, gluten, but actually to barley malt. Happens to be the case for my wife. So she has an allergy to barley malt flour, which is added in r white flour that you buy at the store. So uh, I was trying to make bread with 100% whole wheat because the whole wheat coming from the just the wheat berry has no barley malt flour added and so this would be something that she could she could eat so that's why I was was running these kind of experiments
Here's another example of a loaf of bread. This one, I believe, has some white flour content. Okay, I think that's, that's the end of part three. In uh, the next part, we'll look at some energy consumption uh, experiment, experiments and estimates that I made. Um, check it out. Thank you.